I uh, really don't think we want to friend the future. The future is not always friendly to us. I think the job of leadership is to embrace change, harness the energy of change, find the opportunities within change, and use it to shape a future that friends us. That's what I think leaders have to do. Now, how do you do that? I'm going to share with you my thoughts. They're not necessarily the only thoughts, but they're my thoughts in terms of how I feel I've been able to do that in my lifetime. And I hope that my thoughts are useful to you, either in sharing what I've learned that works for me and may have worked for you, or in provoking you to think about something else that'll work better. There are three words that will incorporate everything I'm going to talk about today. One is humility. Two is adaptability. Three is stability. Now let me tell you a story about humility, and let me tell you why I want to tell you this story. Everybody here is a leader. And all of you are going to have responsibility in one role or another as you go forward to make a better world. You will not be able to succeed without leadership that involves leading other people. You will manage money. You will manage things. You will manage processes. But you must learn to lead people. And humility is a critical component of being able to do that in my life experience. Now let me tell you that in 1953, I was between my sophomore and junior year at Dartmouth College. And in that summer, I met my wife-to-be of 57 years. I met her and I said, I'm going to marry that woman. And she was a senior in high school. And I was going to be a junior in college. So I said, I better get back to Columbus, Ohio and protect my interest. <laughs> so I transferred to Ohio State University. And a year later, we got married when she graduated high school. Now, I went to work in what was then a small, emerging family business that my mother and father had started. I was there for two years. My father called me into his office. He says, Gordy, you're almost hopeless. Two more years at Dartmouth may have ruined you forever. You think you know everything, you don't know anything. You've been here for two years, you haven't asked me a single question. How can I help you learn if you don't admit that you don't know? So if you're so good, I've decided to send you to New York and start a new division for this company. And I said, gee, that's great. Went home, told my wife she loves New York. She says, wonderful. I put together a business plan. I submitted it to my father. He approved it right away. I told him we were going to do $250,000 in sales in the first year, and we were going to break even. Now, we were a small company. Our total profit was $150,000 in 1958 when this was going on. So after about nine months, I realized I'm going to blow this plan out of the water. We're not going to do 250. We'll be lucky if we do 100. We're not going to break even. We're probably going to lose 50 to $75,000. I went back home from Columbus to see my father. I said, Dad, this is what I think is going to happen. What did I do wrong, and how do we fix it? 
He said, you did everything wrong. <laughs> and here's what you need to do in order to fix it. Now, he knew when he approved that plan that it would never work. <laughs> to his eternal credit, he let me walk the plank into the shark-infested waters in the hope that I'd survive. But in the belief that if I didn't, I would be worthless anyway. <laughs> so he said, go and see what you can do. And that was a very humbling experience for me. And I came back and I proceeded with what he had instructed of me. And the next year, we did $250,000 and made a small profit. But I did learn the most important lesson of my leadership career, not just my business career. The most important things that you can learn about yourself are your limitations. To understand your strengths, but to be honest and willing to admit, I don't know. What do you think? to someone who knows more than you about that particular arena and listen. Those are the most powerful words you can use as a leader to build a connection and build mutual trust and respect between those you're working with in order to accomplish whatever the vision is that you're trying to achieve. Now, after the second year, my father brought me home. Now I asked questions. I sat at his feet and I learned. Five years later, my father had a massive coronary and he died at the age of 58. And at the age of 32, I was to take over this small company. We had sales at that time of just under 10 million. We were doing roughly $350,000 in profit. And I knew that I wasn't my father. I knew I wasn't ready. I knew I needed help. And I started to think out what could I do and who could help me. And I decided that what we really needed to do was not find a leader to replace my father, but to build a culture that incorporated the values that he and I both shared about dealing with people and to have the values incul inculcated in the way we dealt with people. We found a man by the name of Dr. Rensis Lickert, the Institute of Search, Social Research that he had founded in Ann Arbor, Michigan. He had a theory. It was unproven. He needed a beta site. We had a need. We were ready to take a risk on his theory, which made sense to me, and become his beta site. The theory was very simple. He believed that most people, most of the time, would return trust with trust. He believed most people, most of the time, wanted to do the job right. He believed that most people, once trained to do their job, were in a better position to figure out how to do it differently and better than anybody else, if you only asked them and empowered them. And he created a system around small teams of 10 to 12 people each, each team assembling a finished product. Each team member having the right to stop production to fix a quality problem, or to stop production to suggest a way to improve cost and drive it down. The system was phenomenally successful. We increased output per man hour by 40%, 40%. Our quality went up, our turnover went down, and we had a globally competitive advantage against the world. In a high labor intensive business that was extraordinarily competitive globally. We kept that advantage for a while and then we realized that people are people. And we moved it through all of our factories in the United States, in Mexico, and then I never wanted to own a factory in China, never. But in China, we had a factory that was a, totally dedicated to our supply, and the owner of that factory had made a bad real estate investment in America and went broke. We desperately needed his production. 
And either the plant was going to close or we had to take it over, so we took it over. Now, I went into China, and I visited this plant for the first time, and I did what I did in all the plants that we owned. First thing I did is go to the restrooms. I can tell everything I need to know about how that manager deals with people by going to the restrooms. These were the worst restrooms I'd ever seen in my life. I took the plant manager aside and I said to him, Mr. Wu, I want you to buy all new fixtures for this restroom. I want you to build all new stalls, paint it, and I want it to be maintained spotlessly clean. I want it when I come next that I would willingly use it. He said, Mr. Zach, that's impossible. I said, Mr. Wu, I'm not telling you how to do it, but I am telling you if I come here the next time and it's not done, you don't have a job. Do you understand? Now I went, I told him I wanted to walk the factory and shake hands with people and introduce myself. He says, they won't look at you. They'll be intimidated. Walk, after 15 people, they all got up. Shook my hand, looked me in the eye, knee how, knee how, knee how. Then I said, we have a factory meeting. What do we do at the factory meeting? I tell them what we want to accomplish. And they ask questions of me. What did I want to accomplish in China? I told them, we want to become the number one needle factory in China. Now we have questions in that. First question, Mr. Zacks, you know we come from northern China. We live in dormitories that you provide for 11 months a year. Then we go back for one month for Chinese New Year's. Mr. Zacks, we have no hot water in the showers. How long have you not had hot water? Two years. Mr. Wu, how much would it cost? How long would it take? We'll have showers for you with hot water in three months. Everybody applauded. Mr. Zacks, you want to be number one needle factory in China. In the summer, it's very hot in Shenzhen. And we don't have fans that work. And we haven't had them for a year. Same routine, you will have fans in one, in one week. Then I leave, thank everybody, come back in a year for my annual visit. Restrooms, spotlessly clean. I walk the floor, everybody's friendly, smiling, talking. Have the plant meeting, have questions. Here are the questions, Mr. Zaps. You want to be number one needle factory in China. You supply cut component parts from Mexico. You pack them this way. If you pack them this way, we can more readily take them from the box and improve our efficiency and reduce cost. Mr. Zaps, second question. You want to be number one needle factory in China. Why do you cut in this manner, if you would cut in this manner, you could get one more piece out of each yard of material and reduce your cost. Every question was about reducing, or every comment was about reducing cost or improving quality. And I walked out of that factory and I realized that humility matters. Being respectful and being understanding of the dignity of other people matters. Giving people an opportunity to contribute with their brain, not just their hands, matters. And you can unleash the latent human potential of caring people, working together to accomplish the objective of whatever the enterprise is you're trying to lead. In summary, I have three messages for you. In our company, to survive throughout this period of 45 years, we have faced a tsunami of external change. We've had to change our entire business model. And we've had to do things that have been very painful in the doing. But we have not only survived in a globally interdependent economy, we have thrived. 
Our sales have increased roughly 30 times. Our profit has increased roughly 50 times. And while we adapted to all of this change, ultimately closing all of our manufacturing, when we had 3,500 people employed in North America, Today we have 120. But the company is a vital and surviving company, providing good jobs for a lot of people who support us and supply us. And when I look at that, and I say, what made the difference? We were adaptable, we were flexible, we were nimble, we responded to change, embraced it, and made change work for us. At the same time, we needed to have inside ourselves, inside our culture, values that had continuity and stability that reflected our worth with each other and how we wanted to deal with each other. And I'm saying that the last thing that each of us needed to have when we implemented Leckert's philosophy was humility. Because instead of the military leader who has the responsibility and the authority to direct and tell you what to do, this is a system that empowers other people to do it. And the leader, the manager, has to be able to say, I don't know, what do you think? And in any aspect of your life, embracing those basic fundamentals of adapting to change, finding opportunity in change, Francis, look, I mean, uh, Peter Drucker once said that of the 10 deadliest sins in business, the worst one was feeding your problem and starving your opportunity. That's true in life, in all dimensions of it, as a parent, as a businessman, in political life. Find the opportunity, seize it, and hold on to it. Remember to be respectful and deep, treat other people with dignity and respect. You come from one of the finest institutions in the world. You've been blessed with one of the greatest educations anyone could get. Remember those people who haven't been as privileged. Respect them for their innate talent and worth. Make sure you appreciate their street smarts and make sure you give them the opportunity to use their brain to make a contribution to whatever it is you're trying to lead. God bless you and good luck, and thank you for letting me be with you.